God's peace to you on this 21st Sunday after Pentecost. Our text this morning is taken from St. Mark, the 10th chapter, verses 35 through 45. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to Jesus and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What is it you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They replied, We are able. Then Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink you will drink, and with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. When the ten heard this, they, became, they began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called them and said to them, You know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. You do not know what you are asking. When I was younger, I heard that God answers prayer three ways. Yes, no, and wait a while. Here Jesus answers with, You do not know what you are asking. It is a gentle no, but a no that comes from Christ's mercy, his desire to protect his own from themselves. James and John ask to sit at the right hand and left of Jesus when he comes into his glory. They ask this because they understand nothing about the glory of Christ. What they picture is an earthly kingdom. They want a Jerusalem without Rome and that toady Herod that they have installed as the king of the Jews. Instead of Pontius Pilate and Herod, James and John would rule the kingdom with King David's heir sitting on the throne as king of kings. That's a pretty big social climb for a couple of fishermen from Galilee. The other disciples see what they are attempting to do to grab personal power, and they become angry. Apparently, because they hadn't thought of it first, which causes Jesus once again to describe an upside-down kingdom where the lowly are raised up and the powerful are brought low. Big is little and little is big. Servants are rulers and rulers are servants. The first are servants and the last are rulers. Where the king came not to be served, but to serve and to save the whole world by trading a throne for a cross and his life's blood as a ransom for a world held captive to sin. Christ has said all this plainly now three times. He will accomplish for us what we cannot do for ourselves. And when James and John come with this request, Jesus first tries to show them their limitations. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? He's told them already that he's about to face a cup of wrath, a judgment for sin that would lead to his arrest, beating, and death. And since that sin was not his own, but the sins of the world that he has already repented in the waters of his own baptism, he reminds them that his baptism is not complete until his cross puts an end to those sins. So James and John, 
Are you able to suffer death and God's judgment? That is what Jesus asks. Problem with sinners is we don't is that we have boundary issues. We don't really know our limits. We imagine ourselves capable of withstanding God's wrath, capable of dying for our own sins. What they have heard Jesus say is, can you take a beating? Can you be tough enough? Can you remain faithful even unto death? And their answer is just a little bit too quick and I think kind of bombastic. Even for the sons of thunder, as Jesus referred to these brothers. Why, yes, Lord, we are able to drink of the cup you drink of and, the baptize, and be baptized with your baptism. I sometimes wish just once the Bible would say something like, And rolling his eyes, Jesus looked at them and said, No, you are not able. That is the whole point of my ministry. You are not capable of withstanding God's judgment, his wrath, nor are you capable of defeating death. If you accept the cup reserved for me, you will die relying on your own merits and the goodness of your own works, your own capabilities. You, could, you imagine yourselves able to give up your life even when you cannot give up enough of your life to be a slave to your brothers? You seek to be their masters, but you do not see me seeking to be their ruler, do you? Whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first must be a slave to all. Until you understand this, you will not enter the glory of God. Glory on earth is most often associated with power, with high position, with great accomplishment. Glory is for the star quarterback who throws for five touchdowns at a homecoming game. Glory is the adoration of 20,000 screaming concert goers celebrating the music of the one who sings. Glory is that brass band playing the red carpet rollout for a dignitary or a king. Glory is for winners, victors, and the triumphant. The disciples, like all sinners in all times, understand that glory is triumph. And yet, Jesus said, the cup that I drink, you will drink, and the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. Of course, they hear that they will have to undergo some inglorious trials to get their power rather than what Jesus actually said to them. My drinking of the cup will become your drinking of the cup. My baptism, death for the ransom of sinners, will become yours as I declare to you, this is my blood shed for you and all people for the forgiveness of sin. My glory will be your glory, but to sit at my right hand or my left is not mine to grant, but is for those for whom it has been prepared. Those for whom it was prepared becomes clear in Mark chapter 15. Two bandits, one at his right and one at his left, the exact wording used in this passage, taunt him as all three suffer crucifixion. When Jesus came into his glory, James and John and their jealous ten friends all fled. Like Adam and Eve, after a bite of the forbidden fruit, they hid themselves from God's glory and left him alone with those who taunted him, including those inglorious bandits, one to the right one on the left. The disciples were not the twelfth man cheering Jesus on to victory when he came into his glory. They could not claim to have supported him from the foot of the cross. They feared, they ran, they hid. 
despite their boasting that they could drink of his cup and be baptized with his baptism, they all scattered and saved themselves. To the eyes of his followers, to the sinners who nailed him to a cross, the suffering and death of Jesus was not glorious. James and John were not there demanding that the thieves be pulled down so that they could be at the right and at the left of Jesus. Jesus died listening to the taunts of the very people he died for, ringing in his ears. One on the right and one on the left. He died the biggest loser. He died the death of the shameful and the inglorious. He made himself a slave to us by taking our sins on his own back, suffering death for our resurrection. It is the most glorious moment in human history, and yet those who sought it didn't see it. They ran. What is it you want me to do for you? Well, make us great, Lord. Make us powerful. Make us big. You do not know what you are asking, Jesus says. The answer is die, Lord. We want you to die to cover our sins. The sins have us and we can't get free. We can't drink of your cup of God's wrath. We cannot be baptized with your baptism because our own sins cling to us. We cannot die for them. We cannot die for the sins of anyone else, nor would we. Every man who has ever shouted from a jail cell, I am innocent, proves that we would never suffer the wrath for someone else's sins. That would be hard to do for someone you love. Our sense of justice would never allow us to innocently die knowing the guilty party was getting off free. It was a foolish request. Short-sighted and sinful. Give me some of your glory, Lord. Give me some of your power. James and John and the other ten don't get it, even in this late hour of Mark's gospel. They should not have asked for power and glory, for those are for God alone, along with the kingdom. Isn't that as we pray it? For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Our glory is in the cross of Christ. That moment when he alone did all that needed to be done for us. The request of a disciple with the cross before him can only be, save me, son of God. Amen.